Hello and welcome to our Candle Violet curriculum. And of course, these are based on the 10 life skills proposed by World Health Organization. And in this series, you will be hearing about the student's manual activities. How do you decode them? How do you convey the message of life skill? And what do you actually do in the entire program or the lessons that we have taught you? So this is an audio lesson plan for our first theme, the life skills, and the first concept of self-awareness. The pages I'm looking at is A1 and A2 right now. If you look at A1 and A2, it's a very, very starting activity which says choose your lollipop. Now, of course, the choice of a lollipop is only a metaphor for the rest of the choices in life. Every theme and every activity has been prepared, keeping a lot of conversation in mind. So when you start choosing an, a lollipop, you actually don't just go ahead and say, which one do you like? You might even go and say, what kind of a candy do you like to talk about? And remember, I'm talking about the early graders. So these are the early primaries. So your six, five, six, and seven years probably will be doing an activity like that. You can also do the same activity with the higher one. Only thing, the concepts and the conversation will be more deeper, which I'll explain to you in a little while. But to begin with, and when you do a lollipop, you all do is a simple analysis where you say, what do you like and what do you dislike in eating? So simple concept is five things that they like to eat and five things they dislike to eat. And most likely you will see the kind of peer group we form. Moment somebody says, I don't like vegetable, the others will almost follow. Ideally, this is an activity that is to be done in TPS, think, pair and share. So you pair two kids, relatively people who don't know each other this could be a first class and first activity and then allow them to do a little brainstorming among themselves and they come up with their own list of 10 food items that they dislike and like together now when you do that you can also go a little deeper in the conversation and start talking about why don't most children like to eat breakfast you see what we are trying to do is there is a fussy breakfast eater among your Student, he may not admit that he's a fussy breakfast. So nobody, no lazy person comes and says that he's lazy. But the others might say, oh, you see the time for the breakfast is very less. We don't like to eat solid food for the breakfast. The kind of spicy food that I don't like. And suddenly you are making a choice that a child is learning about. A great summary of this activity would be to make a list of five delicious breakfasts that students will not say no to. A great help to mothers, ideally, would be a teacher telling this, that listen, if you serve pancakes with honey, the students eating a breakfast would be easy. It, it could be a bowl of fruit salad that a student prefer to eat rather than the poha or the chutney and dosa that she is not liking or the bread omelette that she is completely, you know, disgusted with. So suddenly you are opening a conversation starter and then you can also look at the time that a student need to eat breakfast and perhaps this could be also conveyed to the parent. As I said, if this was done at a deeper level, I'm just taking a little sidetrack because we're talking a lollipop. If you look at the Android operating system, and this is very interesting, the Android operating system are all named after a specific candy. So for example, M stands for Marshmallow, O stands for Oreo, K stands for Kit Kat and the rest. J stands for Jelly Bean and believe me, you will enjoy doing it. The children will enjoy doing it. Even if they are younger, you could say if you're and everybody is crazy about the mobile phone. Imagine your mobile phone is named after a candy. So why don't we do an A to Z of candy? I think right now Google, which owns the Android physically, uh, has only come to J, you might come and tell the rest of it and you might propose and they might even tweet about it or your children get featured if they select your choice of candy. A great side activity and technology integration in the choice of what we are doing. While we are saying that, on your page A2, here is a simple game. Now we are giving them a choice, which is six choices. What kind of topping would you like to have in your lollipops? Remember, sticky banana, we may not like it, but perhaps the kids will say, no, I love sticky banana or hot chocolate or gems. There is actually sour apple, believe me, students love it. And of course, glitter candle has no meaning. If he chooses that, then you have to identify that's not even eatable thing. 
What about marshmallow? Now, if you have a lot of time and I would love to do something which I have been doing it so well with kids in pre-primary, we do a marshmallow test. A marshmallow test essentially is a test which was done by the Stanford University by someone called Walter Michel. His book and his videos are available on YouTube where you make a child sit alone in a room with one marshmallow or anything that you think is what to child like. It could be a hot chocolate, it could be a cookie, it could be a, a, a gems. And you tell a child, if you are willing to wait for some time, an indefinite amount of time, I'll give you two. But if you are not willing to wait and resist, you can eat one. And usually what happens is this is recorded and a child, it's a beautiful video you can show to a child instead of just experimenting and say, you can do a predictive analysis where you can say, okay, what about this child? Will this child eat or not eat? The best part about this marshmallow test is the students who were given this test were studied over the next 20 years. And the one who chose to resist that instant gratification were actually most successful in their relationships, careers, business, and their personal life and health. The ones who chose to eat perhaps were lagging behind. It's a, it's a great test to even test these children's appetite or what else they could do. Your marshmallow could be the peer pressure going for a movie or skipping the breakfast. The last part that you do in this particular activity is a choice of pizza topping. Again, a conversational starter. Maybe a great school for a first day. You can actually have a pizza party if ever you think to be gracious and generous enough. Going ahead in the same theme, we go to A3. And A3 and A4, which is literally just a picture A4, is a topic called be a king or a queen. This is a physical activity, less of a conversation, but it is a lot to do with interpersonal skills. We are also using self-awareness. So what kind of king if you were, you would be? And would you be cruel or kind, powerful or weak, loving or punishing? And you start giving the attributes of what a king could be. A side game around the king is, can we list down at least 10 kings that we think of? It could be Alexander the Great, King Emperor Ashoka, it could be Emperor Akbar, it could be the Roman King Julius Caesar, it could be a mom, mom, modern king somewhere in African region, it could be one of the King Mufasa from the Lion King or King Kong, King Arthur from England and suddenly the children are learning about various kings from across mythology to history, fiction and non-fiction, Narnia perhaps as a king. And what is happening is you're just creating an aura of what a king is. But the beauty of this particular game, besides naming 10 kings, is what if one of you is in a king and you have a crown on your head? So you actually have, you know, the, the, if you have a team of 10, it is an ideal 10 or 12. If you have a lot more, then you divide them into two. Two teachers can be allocated. And every student gets to sit on the throne. The Iron Throne, perhaps, if you are a GOT fan. but And there is a crown. I would love you to make a small crown. The ones that you can, Burger Kings, can be crafted. The side activity could be making a crown craft if you have to, if you have enough time to spare about. But then everybody wears this crown. And then the entire class, so there are 10 students. One student sits in the on the throne with a crown on her head. And the rest of the nine says one good quality or attribute about the student. She helps a lot, She's very. she dresses very well, she always shares a book, she's on time. And believe me, this is called positive reinforcement. What you're doing actually, using this activity, you're making a child aware of what their own strengths are. Too often we tell a child what they're not good at. But imagine if you teach a child what they're good at, the child would actually believe in it. And this positive reinforcement is an amazing tool if you have to read about positive reinforcement. As a teacher, I recommend a book called Power of Subconscious Mind by Dr. Joseph Murphy. It's a great teacher's book to read. But this is my activity. What I'm asking you is, as a be a king, a concept of positive attribute reinforcement. The third activity in the series, A5, is a lovely activity which is all about somebody who says how self-aware are you with your name. You see, your name is much more than just a noun attached to you. Your name is your identity. In fact, there's a riddle which says what belongs to you 
but is used more by others. And of course, you can start your talk by this riddle and it is your name. You know, your name could be Arjun or your name could be Aisha and you hardly use it except to fill a form or to introduce yourself but all the rest of your classmates, your teachers, your parents, your friends call you by your name Arjun and Aisha. Now, the next part is what does your name mean? What is the story behind it? And that would be wonderful because if you go to the etymology, names have great meaning. There is actually a poem on a side note and I would love these kind of things to happen in our classes where this little girl comes and says, we have kept names but somehow we take away the joy of the name. For example, Asha means hope but the child who is in a rural place that has no hope. Or Vidya means education and this child does not have, has not been to a classroom. Or muskan means to smile, but because of poverty, she has not smiled. And you can do a poem with these names. These are, of course, very popular Indian names, but any name will have a root or a history behind it. So you ask a child, what does your name mean? What is the deeper meaning? For example, Arjun was a, one of the brave hearts from Mahabharata. So you are teaching them about the story, about courage, about bravery. You might have a tangent name called Achilles. You know, who was also brave from a different mythology, from a different genre. Everybody has a name and a name has a meaning. Perhaps a student may not even know. So you might have to have lexicon with you or Google the names and find out the meaning beforehand for your student if they do not know. The activity that we have stated in A5 is if you were to write the name and since I've been using Arjun as my example, so why don't they use the letter, the beginning letter A and what else can you think of? So letter is A. What animal can you think of with A? All right. Perhaps a little difficult since I chose this name. It could be Ardwick or an anteater or an antelope. The country with A. Oh, there's too many. America is not a country, by the way. Tell them it's United States. So it could be Argentina. It could be something Angola and whatever they can choose about. A good quality with A. Oh, that's an adjective. Yes. So it could be admirable, it could be affectionate, anything that you think. Another person's name with A. So you could talk about, you know, Aisha, the second name we chose about. A car. Oh, that's an interesting one. I don't know if most of us would know a lot of car, but A is easy. There's an Audi with A. So you can do that. And it's a fun game that you play with. Now, A5 and A6 is also about name. But here, there's, there are two games within a sub game. Game number one is you have got a complete amalgam of lots of names. And these are probably Western or European common names that are there. A child may have to pick up, say, 10 names that begins with E. Because I see a lot of E here. So there's Emma, there's Emily, there's Ella. Or they could be with M, Mia, Maria, Mary, or S, Sophia, Sondre, Sebastian. So you could do a letter game and they can find out. Number two, you can, you can find out that do you realize there's something specific about the colors we've chosen? So now you, they, I want them to come up and say, all right, the ones in the blue shades are all boys and the ones in the red shade are all girls. You can talk about... Just It is just to speak about gender and I speak a lot about gender uh, diversity saying no, this is only to make it easy but it could be very well about some names which could be both genders. Is there a name that comes to your mind which is used for both the genders? Uh, the only name right now that comes to mind is Jyoti. Right? Jyoti of course is more feminine. Jyoti means light or a dia, but they were, there are few, I had a friend called Jyoti, there's a very popular chief minister of West Bengal called Jyoti Basu, so you have some names which are both, and there's no shame in that. The activity that they can do physically in the classroom is they can make a word anagram, so as always I give a class size of 10 to 12 or 20 or irrespective, you can make them make a word puzzle with the name. So the word puzzle will look like if there's a name called Arjun and Jyoti as we are getting it. So you write A-R-J-U-N and from J like a scrabble, you write Y-O-T-I, perhaps diagonal or horizontally. 
the, the Arjun is written horizontally, so this becomes written vertically. And you add names and there is a cross section, it's fun. You can make them in teams of five and the first one that can get the names is a winner. If the five are finished, you combine the two teams, ten. And as they do, they, the class becomes a full beautiful chart with a name anagram which can be stuck in the class corridor or the or the hallway or the gate to the class and remember this also is your first class so it will be more fun when they get to know each other so this was an entire activity number one in the violet one a activity on life skills and primary life skill was self-awareness hello and welcome to candle violet and we are in a second theme the newsmaker this theme specifically talks about people who have made peace around the world and those are the newsmakers we would like to introduce to our children. The first one of course anyone who talks about peace is a person who is telling about empathy in the world. So my the first two of those peacemakers will be in a slide B1 my page B1 I'm talking about a very very simple page it's just a very ordinary looking comparative picture. Now what the concept of empathy says is they need to appreciate how lucky we are unless and until we are able to do that we will not be able to actually look at the others and say no they are the ones who are deprived today our children are born and living in a luxurious world you know they have air conditioned room refrigerators always there they are living in cities and urban areas where there is no concept of load shedding or power shutdown so we have to first understand before you even go to war and peace and analyze the pictures my first thing will be a list down all the blessings that you think that you are surrounded with again this could be a TPS activity like we did in a first chapters first activity where they list down all the blessings that they think of you know a simple concept of blessing could be as simple as wearing a very good shoe a lot of children, you know, this is a small side story about Indian team going and playing football in the FIFA World Cup and they had to play barefoot because that's how they practice with. These nice anecdotes actually make a student think. Somebody can play FIFA football barefooted and yes, that was a real story about Indian football team. I give you another anecdote as a teacher that you can share with is how people perceive the blessing. So there were two salespeople who were sent to a remote African village to sell shoes and nobody wore shoes in that African village so the first one goes there and he's appalled and he's disgusted saying nobody wears shoes here there is no market for us nothing will sell and he sends a reply to his company the second salesperson sees that nobody is wearing shoes and he says He's thrilled and he says, look, nobody's wearing shoes here. The entire market is ours. Let's sell more of the shoes. The students need to appreciate and look at the world around with a sense of optimism, not pessimism. The activity here compares two scenarios of war. War 1 is an olden war. So you can see a French or a British looking general on a horseback. Cavalry is what horses are called. And there is a scenario, there is war, there is a cart which you would not find soldiers are, are walking so suddenly you are talking to them in a language that this is how the wars were fought earlier number one thing you need to do is ask them to describe what they see again the three parts of the army that you can see here or the army navy and the air force those are the three levels you talk about then the people on the horseback are called cavalry the people on the foot are called infantry another two new words that you introduce and these are, these are some really sound looking words that a kid's going to get introduced to. You can also ask what are the other two more animals that people have used in warfare. And yes, you write it is the elephants that people have used, especially the kings and Alexanders and the, and the Persians that have used. You can talk about a wonderful movie which had a lot of animals and warfare called the 300, the Spartans movie. And then we also have camels which even today in the desert, the... the the soldiers stationed there use camel to patrol the area. After having described it, look at the modern warfare. You can actually go back and look at even better images, better pictures and show them a modern warfare has tanks and a lot of iron basically, iron and steel. You've got naval warships, warheads, you've got nukes and submarines and of course the aircraft carriers and the MiGs and the aircrafts and the flights. 
let them go back and now you can make a class into two groups and tell them which war wars are never good the point of the war is there will be damage there will be people dying so at the end of it war by itself are not good but perhaps you need to fight the tyrant for example the world war ii the allies had to fight the axis power to gain control over the dictatorship of hitler but comparing the two war which one's more devastating which is which has a little more collateral damage is after you use and you realize that the modern wars are more dangerous because one bomb like in hiroshima and nagasaki can destroy an entire city so the two cities that are destroyed with these atomic bombs and look at today we have at least seven countries in the world which are nuclear warheads which would mean the end of the world by itself comparatively an olden war was fought pre precisely with very few casualties only the people in the war would die the soldiers from the opposite end would die and the civilians and the women and the children would be safe inside their own cities in barricades and villages that's one area of a war two of course looking at the bullets that we have got the wars kill instantly there are more damages with the bombs earlier there were people with using mostly swords or air rifles and physical combat we are looking at a lot of war and peace i would not want to end this activity just on a comparative of an olden and a modern war rather i would want them to look at why should we give peace a chance because i want my children to look at newspapers and tell me at least the name of few areas which are really peaceful in the world and what have they done to make the world peaceful of course among the three key thing to have peace is good employment so people are happy they have employed education is good and their good lifestyle of medical facilities or health of the nation is good so you know peace has conditions and if you can fulfill the conditions this could be my entire activity a lot of conversation that probably you see i would actually be very happy if you email us at info at skyeducation.in we can share a nice world war ii presentation with you where you can actually show an entire graphic of how the world war ii was played out with a lot of nice animated guns and and sounds of the aircraft where you can actually ask us about it and we will probably provide you with it b2 is about peace symbols now while the first one was a lot about war and how the war impacted the world we are looking at artist and we saying look at the symbols of peace probably the three symbols the two is repeated it's a victory sign it's a leaf or a fern that you see here and there is a pigeon or a dove with an olive leaf you can ask the children what could the origin of these peace symbols be so you start with number 1 the origin the origin of the dove is the easier one where it is said it's a biblical story where when noah and his ark sailed over and the world was destroyed god had a rainbow of course these are stories that we make a legends but the idea was they saw a dove which says now a promise that the world will not be destroyed with deluge the entire world it could also mean that when the olden sailors sailed they would set these birds out there would be ravens and doves which will fly and if they were to come back that means the land or island is not nearby if they were not to come back you would know that they have settled down in an island and the land is near it, land of course symbolizes peace because you are in a raging tempest ocean and you would like to set ashore so that's a story you can tell tell them to make a story of the victory symbol which is just two two fingers you show them and say that's v or victory symbol and when you are victorious peace is ensured fern is again another area leaves greenery is lot about peace and why we say is because when there are when there is destruction there is no peace but when peace thrives then the nature also thrives so leaves and flowers and trees and birds you can hear and see all around so peace could also be represented by different things like the symbol of a heart as in love or two hands shaking as in sharing or just music which is beautiful universal words that you sing festivals bring peace and people together so why don't you ask your children to draw one symbol which is not in the picture that can represent peace 
Now the reason I told you these is now they have to think differently. They might draw a sun, they might draw a world, they might draw a smiley face. Encourage them and here also you give them a lot of things to draw with. Usually when you only give a pencil and a paper, they will draw a very ordinary picture. Give them crayons, sketch pens, color paints, make them routines, give them chart papers, glitters, glue and tell them to really make a fantastic peace symbol. And believe me, you can take snapshots of these peace symbols, tag us on Facebook, which is skyeducation.in and we'll love to retweet or share these likes and post. The third one on concept of newsmaker for peace is an internal concept of peace. Now, what we say is peace cannot be existing in isolation in silos. So children also think of a world peace and then they have they forget that peace could also mean something to them relevant to them so what we are looking at as a peace symbol is what about peace at home a lot of them have siblings do you fight with your brother and sister and we can actually discuss sibling issues and why do siblings fight is it good or bad on a, on a flip side, we actually tell them sibling fighting is actually teaching them emotional skills. And we did a chapter on emotions. For example, tiger cubs, when they fight, they are learning hunting skills. So, you know, it's a natural way for them to know how people get hurt when they fight, how people use bad word and words hurt deeper than scars. So suddenly you're talking a lot about it. And then you can also do a small thing that perhaps the sometimes always the elder is told that you should be compromising so here you might be addressing the younger lot and say look sometimes you have to just understand and negotiate your way out instead of snatching a toy you can ask for it can i play for 10 minutes and here you can ask and teach them five strategies that that will help them learn how to negotiate sibling rivalry believe me students are very apt and we are teaching them life skills so teach them one could be, you know, at the time they said, one could be an, a barter system. I'll exchange my toy with yours. One could be, you know, pleasing them with little pleasant words. It makes us say. The fourth one could be writing a small letter or note and say, you see, Didi, can I please take your toy for a minute? And sometimes words are very important. And the fifth one could be, you tell them, I will help you clean your cupboard or I can help you, you know, do this in a craft or whatever your talent is. And in exchange, I want this particular thing. I'm sure they will forget it when it comes to fighting, but at least the strategies will stay with them a longer phase. Then the third thing you do is you look at the picture and you do decode what are the faces saying. Remember, we did a face emotional one. So why are they fighting? Who is the aggressor? Who is talking about it? What could be the age of the girls? Why are they fighting about? Is it a remote that they're fighting about? What could be so exciting on a television they're fighting about? You are getting to know much more about these children. And always when you do the activity, don't do a whole class activity. You always make them into pairs and groups. The final thing on this B3 is you can draw an angry face. A lot of things you see is a connection and I would like them to draw on the picture an angry face and then you can say when do you think three people of your family get angry. So your mother, your father, any elder or guardian or some, even it could be a pet animal that you have. So you know you are doing a conversation of a angry and the reason for being angry with. You can finally conclude with saying when do you get angry. Say three things that make you angry and perhaps they might say school, they might say homework, they might say when somebody takes my football away, when I'm, I'm supposed to eat or mama takes away my mobile phone and believe me, make a note of these, these will be very useful for you to make a student profile. So this ends up our newsmaker and a lot of sub sessions and sub activities and thoughts we gave it. One final overall take on newsmaker because peace was my language. You can teach children at least five Nobel Peace Prize winners. I, I'm sure you have spoken about Dalai Lama and Mother Teresa as you spoke about. But there's so many more people you can speak about. There is one amazing gentleman, the South African Nelson Mandela, who is a Peace Prize winner. Then you have the youngest Peace Prize winner, Malala Yousafzai. So that makes it four. Number five, of course, Barack Obama got a Peace Prize. So you can speak about them. And you can connect it with Martin Luther King, who got a Nobel Peace Prize way back. If you want to talk about an organization that won peace, then Greenpeace have won organization as an organization one. And I, there is a climate control uh, organization that has won. Please do your research on it. So suddenly you're talking about four or five individuals and two organizations that has won 
peace prize as an indian context a very proud indian so you can us should talk about the indian peace prize winner and that is kailash satyarthi now kailash satyarthi did a lot of work for these children who are part of the domestic violence and abuse and he rescued them and this is a great way to talk about usually no lot of people do not know about his work and effort so that would be really good where he was jointly awarded with malala and and his work is is really featured as one in the fortune magazine as he's got amazing other awards also and that could be something you can speak about a, a side thing would be you can actually design a nobel peace prize and locally you can find someone in your local this is a community project but i would so happy that a local peace award you can give you can call it a sky peace prize winner and believe me it will be so amazing to find out someone who's working say for stray dogs or working for uh, victims of burns in hospital or education for underprivileged children or someone who's giving food you know there are a lot of people and he, they might be someone in your neighbor in your vicinity someone of your uncle you know of and you can actually give them a nobel peace prize a local sky peace prize i would be very happy if you do that again tag us and we'll love to know more about it thank you so much Hello and welcome to Candle Violet and we are doing environment as my theme and save energy as my thug theme. If there is one topic the kids will run away from is talking about energy and environment conservation. There is so much of theory that the kids have been pushed through and suddenly instead of becoming environment crusaders they have become the people who would say I don't care about it. The problem is in the approach on what we have done with our students. If only we could actually excite them about environment by doing activities around it. So today we'll attempt to do the same environment and conserve energy concept, but probably we will do it in a little more interactive way. That's a approach that Sky Education have always used. To be more conscious about what environment is about, I'm actually calling this as an empathy sub skill on what they have to do on the environmental front. So the two pages that I'm going to use are C1 and C2 and a very basic activity we start with it itself directly is after talking about why is it important and how important energy is we are looking at a tree of light. Now of course we ask a child give them a nice large chart paper you can make them do a sticky thing and let them draw or you know a full fledged tree but instead of the leaves you this time tell them we only want to ask you to to actually draw bulbs of course a great teacher would do a lot more than just do bulbs you can actually ask them to have separate bulbs being drawn and every other child can stick those bulbs around so it's a small thing so you know bulbs are, are easy to replicate and then you have at least 20 30 40 50 bulbs that people are going to stick around now tell them this is a tree of light and this tree is supposed to remind us that every time you use an electrical appliance you actually are using electricity and energy now there are two different activities i would like them to do around it number one since you have used a bulb if i were to ask you to take a resource and this particular resource is if you can do an led or a bulb yes a small bulb or an led take a battery with you a small 2 volt battery 5 volt battery that you get it and a set of some wires along with a little capacitor or something that you can act as a switch you see you are making a very very ordinary circuit in your class believe me there are enough youtube videos you can look and make this circuit and this circuit is so exciting for a child that you are consuming the battery life to actually use your own energy source and create a light source it may look like a very very cumbersome experiment but these are five two or three simple equipment that are available at your local shop you know a local light or 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 a, you know does the kind of plumbing equipment you get nails and hammers that kind of a shop will be able to provide it a simple circuit that is what i would like you to make that's all it's a very very ordinary thing so suddenly you're talking about lots of concept that actually has to be taught in science but you don't have to do anything about it then what you do is you go and take c2 as your page after you're done and circuit will take good enough final time and in c2 you tell them 
that look there are these appliances you use at home and all of them use energy so let them name them and most of them would eventually have it for example an appliance like a mobile phone or a, or a laptop you might ask them how many you have in home so probably there are four members in the family apart from the kids then there are four mobile phones that you're using every time you charge discharge a mobile phone you're using some form of energy you can ask them to go and count the number of light bulbs they have and this will be very interesting how kind, what kind of light bulbs are you using in your home ions there there's a microwave there's a refrigerator there's a washing machine there's a plasma screen tv you might not have a dishwasher some have dishwashers and besides this there may be other electrical equipments and appliances we may not know so let them make a list of all the appliances they can think of it could be a divided activity that you do it one day before you you make them you give a list to them and they go home and start ticking things around and this is an activity that they make a complete list of the equipment now using this appliances each appliance is going to be written down in a small sheet of paper and this sheet of paper is to be stuck in the energy tree that they have drawn now of course the energy tree because it goes collectively they can also draw individual energy tree which they can take home and they can write down or stick the names of the appliances that use energy make it a game of course they may not know it's nothing to be proud of but let's say the the team or the individual that has maximum appliances wins while winning is important but we'll also tell them as a, as a you know we'll flip this in my next activity but right now tell them to find and list and name as many appliances they can your own study should have been that you would have gone home and found out all the appliances given them names so they can go home and then verify the list with what you've done so this is my particular activity of c1 and c2 with regards to energy saving c3 is relatively one single page activity call a source of light i call it the bright day it's a very very ordinary activity but what we're going to do with it is extraordinary they have to look at the picture and they have to only find out what source of energy is missing from the picture of course for you you can you can deliberate on the picture you can make them think but a smart child will immediately say it looks like a day the sun is missing so they know sun as a source of energy now my sub point is my sun is a source of light and energy I can do a small thematic reference on what and how is sun important in our solar system. What is sun? Sun is a star. How long does the sunlight take to reach earth? Close to 8 minutes. So you know these are small small fact finding things that you do on a sun. What is sun primarily made of? Sun is primarily made of gases and the gases could be helium and hydrogen and a bit of nitrogen along with it. Now the stars closest to the planet closest to the sun is Mercury but the hottest planet actually Venus. What happens is because of the, because of the uh, nitrogen and carbon dioxide on Venus is the greenhouse effect that's why it retains a lot of energy and it is despite being second most uh, closest not first it's still hotter than Mercury. So you can talk about a greenhouse effect and what sun does. Of course, this is sun as my entire project. If they have not done enough of craft and if your class can still enjoy it, you can still go ahead and now instead of making a craft, you can make a ball sun. So a sun ball. You can, there, there are thermocol available which are round and they can be colored bright red, uh, orange, crimson or yellow. And this could be a sun and they can hang in. A smart, again a teacher is, you can put a bulb inside and you can make a night lamp or a bulb around the sun. Amazing thing can happen only with this one light source called the sun. But my point is not just the sun, I would like them to list down the light sources they can think of. So a torch light is a light source, a lighthouse is a light source, uh, a mobile you know in terms of the mobile torch which is different from the flashlight is a light source, your car, car headlights is a light source. Of course, all these are using basic light. Is moon a light source? Well, moon uses the reflected light of the sun. But yes, it is still a light source. You know, reflection or no reflection, you're still using the moonlight in the night. But it's not a primary source of light. So these are, these are two few things you have done with regards to the bright day activity. It's not over yet. The reason I'm saying it's very interesting is we remember did an activity before on the appliances that uses electricity in the night. A prerequisite for this course is I would like them to bring the electricity bills. You know, this is something you will have to remind them. You must bring your own bill. You can go online and check and then find out 
decode the electricity bill. How you decode is, tell them what is the source of energy that is required. So electricity bill measures this electricity in kilowatt. Kilowatt is a unit of energy where you measure your unit of energy where you measure electricity in. You also can tell them the, the, the amount of money they use per month. So that is called what we in a, in a simple term say it's a light bill. But actually it should be called the energy bill that you use per month. Now the challenge for these kids is let's say let's say an approximately they use two and half thousand rupees or five thousand rupees. I'm just giving exaggerated numbers depending on your household. 2000 rupees let me make it or a 50 dollar light bill that was generated this month in the month of may and may of course being the the hottest month in the indian subcontinent you will use more of electricity more of more of uh, your uh, air conditions and that's where shoots up the light bill can they reduce the light bill a challenge to them and come back in june and we see so after three weeks your, your cycle will be repeated and can we see a reduction for 45 dollars to 1500 rupees instead of 2000 of the light bill believe me it's such an amazing thing the students going home and just asking for a light bill or if you can get the numbers and you can go on and print them out it is something they've never experienced and never done in their entire energy activity you can bring your own light bills, a couple of uh, three month or four month light bill together, cumulative and say, look at the light bills that I have collected and they can decode the light bill for you. They can also make my favorite activity a, a bar graph on the light bill. How did it increase? Did it increase? And, and then they can find out which month the light bills are highest and which month it is lowest. And all of them is available online. So all you do is download the PDF and show them or print it out and show them the light bills for the one entire year cycle. So this brings an end to C3, our second activity on environment and save energy and we go to C4. C4 is about alternate forms of energy and of course we are looking at solar energy. So even before you go in, let them decode what solar energy is about. Solar energy is about tapping the natural radiant sunlight and harnessing it into a any any useful thing so there's so many sub themes of solar energy it could be solar heating it could be solar thermal energy solar architecture uh, modern solar power plants artificial photosynthesis photovoltaic of course you can make a note of these things and then this becomes a part of your solar energy what are the other forms of alternate energy yes there is a wind energy that you can use and there is hydro energy that you can talk about now of course remember Wind mills and wind turbines is a world of difference. You know, there was a lovely uh, quote from President of the United States where he confused between the wind mills and wind turbine. Wind mills are what you find in Netherlands, a small, nice thing that goes around. They don't harness as the energy we're looking at. Wind turbines are sleek, smart, small panels that turn fast and because of the wind and it converts the energy into a form of usable energy that we talk about the kinesthetic kinesthetic energy so these are two more sources dams uses a lot of hydropower and if you look at a modern area in india they have this entire cochin airport where which is the largest you know solar panel display in the country at an airport where they're harnessing the solar power which is interesting now let a student go and understand go online look at the pages and see how they do it besides that I've given a picture which is using solar energy on an aircraft. So you see the panels on an aircraft and believe me, you can ask them, is it worthy? Because the planes are going up and they're closer and the sunlight could be more direct, does it make a difference? Let them go research, let them discuss and debate it and find out if this is a useful invention. We are little making them into solar activists and they find out if this actually will help having panels on an aircraft. On a side note, I would like them really to design a solar panel. Now that would be a little challenging, but you can go again online, look at how does a DIY solar panel is designed? You, what are the things you need in designing a, you know, a, a solar panel? These are, these are of course high advances, but you can just find out what are the equipment that goes in in making a panel. It could be inverter, it could be rack, it could be the thermal uh, thermistors. But of course, these are something I just wanted to, you can do the aluminum, aluminum foil, a demo dummy piece. That's something for your class craft to design a solar panel. My activity on page number C5 is using and asking that how do I use my solar energy? So there's an electric car. 
can it be converted into of course you can talk about tesla and elon musk dreams of what an electric car looks like which can be plugged and played mobile chargers are not so common but soon you will find solar mobile chargers pretty he is simple all you put is put the panel close to the sun in your hand and it gets charged up find out what about hot air balloons can i use solar panel on hot air balloon or will the balloon burst so it's just an activity a thinking program you're doing it you've done enough around it so your your entire time is consumed in making them discuss and plan this now can they think of one more solar powered machine and they can draw it so it could since we spoke about the car it could be anything i'm giving you some ideas for you to think on what about classrooms and we have solar power on a classroom roof so our air condition the classroom is using solar power what about water heaters which is still very fairly common what about your uh, watches or clocks using solar power so you know just ask them random questions and see if these people can decode some of the solar power concepts that we have so this is all on environment and hopefully you've made them enough conscious around and they become crusaders for the environment.